This is Chapter 7, Estimating Parameters and Determining Sample Size. Section 7.1 is Estimating a Population Proportion. This section presents methods for using a sample proportion to make an inference about the value of a corresponding population proportion. A point estimate is a single value that's used to estimate a population parameter, and for us we will be using p hat and x bar, talking about proportions and means. The sample proportion p hat is the best point estimate of the population proportion p. p hat is an unbiased estimator of p. A confidence interval, and that's what we'll be discussing this chapter, a confidence interval or an interval estimator is a range or an interval of values used to estimate the true value of a population parameter. And you use this already in just how you think of different things. So maybe you'll walk out of a classroom after taking an exam and you feel pretty confident about it and you might say, oh, I did pretty good. I think I got like an A or a B on this exam. And so um, you'll, you know, maybe going into like a sporting event, you'll be, I'm pretty confident that my team is going to win. Um, maybe by so much, you might even say. So this idea is now going to be put into statistical terms and we'll give it some values and different things like that. So we have what's called a confidence level and this is the probability of 1 minus alpha such as 0.95 or 95 percent that the confidence interval actually does contain the population parameter. Assuming that the estimation process is repeated a large number of times. Alpha is the degrees of confidence or the confidence coefficient an example of the correct interpretation of a confidence interval would be we are 95% confident that the interval from 0.405 to 0.495 actually does contain the true value of the population proportion P. So right below this we have an example. The example says a USA Today poll asked 1,006 adult Americans how much it would bother them to stay on a room on the 13th floor in a hotel. Interestingly, 13% say it would bother them. The margin of error was 3 percentage points, 95% confidence. Which of the following represents a reasonable interpretation of the survey results? For those not reasonable, explain the flaw. So first thing, let's before we look at these, let's just try to understand this problem. It says 13% would bother them to stay on the 13th floor. And then we also have this margin of error and it says it's three percentage points. And so we haven't talked about margin of error yet, but most students kind of have an idea of what that is. So a margin of error would be some kind of error, and it's usually thought about as being a plus or a minus, kind of like when you walk out of that classroom and you're saying, I got maybe between an A and a C, or maybe you're between a 85 and a 95 percent or something along those lines. So since it is a 13 percent that we have that it would bother them, that error is going to be a plus or minus because it could be a little bit higher or a little bit lower. That margin of error that we have is three percentage points. So plus or minus three percentage points. And so if you were to subtract three percent from 13 percent, you would have 10 percent. And adding 3 to the 13, you would get 16%. So looking at the four different options that we have here, first one I want to note is if you read B, you'll notice that it says between 92% and 98% confident that 13% of adult Americans would be bothered to stay in a room on the 13th floor. That confidence level is stated up above and it's at a 95% confident level and we don't change that. That confidence level doesn't change. What changes is the percentage or that proportion of people that are bothered to stay on that 13th floor is going to be between a range but not the confidence interval. So this one is not correct. And again this is because level of confidence does not change. So level of confidence doesn't vary. So it has to stay the same for the problem. Um, looking right below this at C, it says in 95% of samples of adult Americans, the proportion 
who would be bothered to stay in a room on the 13th floor is between point 10 and point 16. And it does look really nice. However, that 95% here is our confidence level. And this says of the samples. And that's not correct. So this is not correct either. So this is suggesting that the interval sets the standard for all other intervals. So this is not correct. It should be 95% confidence level. And then looking at part D right below this, it says we are 95% confident that 13% of adult Americans would be bothered to stay in a room on the 13th floor. And what's missing from this one is that it doesn't say anything about that margin of error. So I don't know what values it would be between. So this one's not correct also. And so the, the interval has not been um, set up or, or understood. So no margin of error provided or there was nothing discussed about the interval going from one value to another value. So that means that part A is correct. So let's go ahead and look at this. So A says we are 95% confident that the proportion of adult Americans who would be bothered to stay in a room on the 13th floor is between 0.10 and 0.16. So again, it kind of has seen a little bit of everything that we saw that was a problem with the other three. So right below this it says a confidence level of 95% tells us that the process that we are using should in the long run result in a confidence interval limits that contain the true population proportion 95% of the time. So suppose that a random sample of size n is obtained from a population in which each individual either does or does not have a certain characteristic. Then our sample proportion, or p hat, is x divided by n, where x is the number of individuals with a certain characteristic, and n is going to be our sample size. So the example right below this says, in a town of 500 households, 220 have a dog. The population proportion of dog owners in this town expressed as a decimal is, and our p hat value is going to be that 220 divided by 500. So again, 220 are the number of people that have a dog, and 500 is our sample. And then dividing this out, I'll just round two decimal places here, that would be 0.44. Note, a second survey of 500 households would likely have a different estimate of the proportion of households that own a dog. So going to different cities or different areas and towns and sampling 500 people from each of those and determining how many people have a dog, we most likely would not end up with 220 every single time that we go and survey. And so that's why we have a confidence interval and they are going to be between certain values and your confidence level tells you that so many will be between those two values. So because the value of p hat varies from sample to sample, it is a random variable and has a probability distribution. To get a sense of the shape, center, and spread of the sampling distribution p hat, we can obtain a random sample of data over and over again, get a list of the sample proportions, create a histogram of the sample proportions to gain an idea of the shape of the distribution, calculate the mean, gives us a center, an idea of the center of the distribution, and calculating the standard deviation will give us an idea of the spread of that distribution. So we have critical values, and so critical values, again, are the numbers that borderline separating the values that are significantly low and significantly high, and again, the center part would be not significant. Significantly high are on the right side, and then significantly low are small and on that left side. So for example, 95% level of confidence, or alpha equals 0 0.05, implies that if 100 different confidence intervals are constructed, each based on a different sample from the same population, then we expect 95 of the intervals to be including the parameter and 5 not to include the parameter. So 95% of the time the parameter will be included in that interval. And so down below, 
you'll notice that we have our bell-shaped curve again and 95% again that was our confidence level and you'll notice that alpha again was 0 0.05 and so to get this 2.5% here that's just alpha divided by 2 since it's getting split into two tails. So a 95% level of confidence does not tell us there is a 95% probability the parameter lies between the lower and the upper bounds. So the table below has the most commonly used confidence levels. We will in the example below calculate one that is not listed on the table so we know how to do this for different confidence levels but 90, 95% and 99% are the most commonly used confidence levels. So this is a nice table to keep in mind when you're doing homework. So on here you'll notice that alpha which is our second column here is found by doing 1 minus the confidence level and we get these critical values. So the example right below, we will go through an example to see how to calculate these critical values depending on our confidence level. So the example right below says calculate the critical value for a 98% confidence level round three decimal places. So on here, our critical value, if you notice, it is a Z. A Z means that we are dealing with a standard normal distribution and so mean is 0 and our standard deviation is equal to 1 and so our alpha value here is going to be equal to 1 minus our confidence level which is 98 percent written as a decimal is 0 0.98 which is 0 0.02 and so I'm going to go ahead and draw our standard normal curve over here on the right our mean is 0 and we go in the middle and again, when you deal with confidence levels, there's always um, a plus or minus error, if you think of it that way. And so that means that we are going to be dealing with what's called a two-tailed idea. And so putting a significantly high and significantly low value on here for my critical values. And I'm going to go ahead and call this first one Z1 and the second one Z2. And again, using Zs, since this is a standard normal distribution. This area here in the middle between Z1 and Z2 is equal to my confidence level. So for us, this is 0 0.98. And then we have 0 0.02. And then splitting that into each of these tails, you would take your 0 0.02 and divide by 2 and get 0 0.01. And likewise, 0 0.01 also here. So in order to calculate these values of Z1 and Z2, like we did in the previous chapter, we need to use inverse norm. So inverse norm is going to be, again, area to the left. And for Z1, the area to the left is 0 0.01. Mean is 0. Standard deviation is 1. Z2 is going to be inverse norm. Area to the left of Z2 is going to be the 0.98 plus the 0 0.01, which is going to be 0.99. Mean is 0, standard deviation is 1. So Z1 is equal to negative 2.326, and Z2 is equal to positive 2.326. Again, remember that your standard normal curves or any normal curve is going to be symmetric. So if you know one of those values, you should automatically know the other. Right below this are the requirements to create a confidence interval for estimating a population proportion. So definitely something that we need to know. We have three things here that we will have to check. The first one is that the sample is going to be a simple random sample or an SRS. Two is going to be conditions for the binomial distribution are satisfied. This is back in section 5.2. There are four things that have to be checked. So definitely something you want to go back and add to your notes on your own going back and looking at section 5.2. And then number three says verify the normal distribution is suitable approximation to the binomial distribution by verifying both n times p and n times q are both greater than or equal to 5. Right below us it says the higher level of confidence leads to a wider interval and a larger margin of error. 
So here's our margin of error finally. We did discuss this in that first example on the first page, but this is written as E, capital E, is the maximum likely amount of error between the sample proportion P hat and the population proportion P. It is also called the maximum error of the estimate and can be found by E is taking the upper bound minus the lower bound and dividing by two or you can take z alpha over two times the square root of p hat times one minus p hat divided by n. And so we're gonna go ahead and look at these both. And that z alpha over two that's listed here is from the table that you have on the previous page or you can calculate them like we did in the example right below that. And again, that depends on your confidence level. So note it says, one, the confidence interval about the population proportion is of the form p hat plus or minus e. The point estimate p hat is the midpoint of the upper and the lower bound. And three, the margin of error e is the difference between the point estimate and the lower bound. So a visual representation of this would be p hat, and we would plus and minus e from this. And when you add e to p hat, we get what's called our upper bound of our confidence interval. And then subtracting e would give us our lower bound. Another way to think of p hat is in the middle of the lower and the upper bound. So to find that midpoint, you would take your lower bound, I'll put lb for lower bound, and add together with that our upper bound and I'll put UB for that, and then divide it by two, and this gives us what's called our midpoint, like we saw earlier in the semester. Another way to write this would be that our population proportion would be in between P hat plus E and P hat minus E. This is called a trilinear inequality. And sometimes you will be asked to express your answers as a trilinear inequality, and this is what it would mean. Other ways that you might be expressing your answers could be as p hat plus or minus e, or as p hat minus e, comma p hat plus e inside parentheses. And again, that would be your lower bound and your upper bound. There's an example right below this. This is express the confidence interval using the format p hat plus or minus e around three decimal places. It tells us the confidence interval for the proportion of red M&Ms is between 0 0.0434 and 0 0.217. So between about 4.34% and between about 21% will be the amount of red M&Ms that you have. So we need to find p hat, and in order to do that, we have our lower bound here and our upper bound here. And so we can add together our lower bound and our upper bound. So lower is 0 0.0434 plus 0 0.217, add those together, divide by 2, and we get 0 0.130. E? Our margin of error is the distance from p hat to either the lower bound or the upper bound. So you can think of it that way. Um, you can also do the formula that's written and typed up above, which says our upper bound. So there's a few different ways to calculate this. Minus your lower bound. And then divide by 2. Rounding three decimal places, we get 0 0.087. And it does say to express our answer as p hat plus or minus e. So p hat, again, is 0 0.130. Plus or minus e would be 0 
Constructing a confidence interval for a population proportion with our graphing calculator, again with a TI-83 or 84. Step one would be to calculate our p hat, which is x divided by n. Step two is verifying that we can actually perform the confidence interval and find this. To do that, it has to be a simple random sample. Binomial distribution must be satisfied, and n times p and n times q both are greater than or equal to five. Step three is gonna be you go to stat, your stat button, go to test, go down to one prop z int, so standing for one proportion, z because that's our um, variable that we'll be using, and int meaning interval. So entering x and n values in, entering your confidence level, which they call your c level, highlight calculate and select enter. The answer is going to give your lower bound and your upper bound, or your lower limit and upper limit. Step four is going to be to interpret your results. So the example right below says, in a study of the accuracy of fast food drive through orders, McDonald's has 33 orders that were not accurate among 362 orders observed. And this is based on data from QSR magazine. Round your answer to four decimal places. So part A says find the best point estimate of the population proportion P. For the proportions, we have our notation would be p hat, and this is found by taking x divided by n, so x would be the number of people who have inaccurate orders, divided by n, which is our sample, dividing 33 divided by 362, rounding four decimal places, we get 0.0912. Part B says identify the value of the margin of error E for a 95% confidence interval. So in order to calculate E, we had a few different formulas on the previous page. I'm going to go ahead and scroll back to that so we can look at those. And those two formulas are up here and they are starred and typed. So the first one is where we had our critical value p hat and n are what we need to know, and the second formula is where we have our upper bound and our lower bound. So for this one, I do not know my upper bound and my lower bound. I do know my value for p hat, I do know n, and then we can look at and see if we can figure out z alpha over two. So going back down to the example, so the formula that we would be using would be e equals it's z alpha over two times the square root of, and it's p hat times one minus p hat, all divided by n. And so we do know the value of p hat, and we do know the value of n. So how do we get the value of z alpha over two? If you go back and you look at your table on page two, you'll note that our confidence level here is 95%. So if you look at 95% confidence level at the table on the bottom of page 2, alpha is equal to 0 0.05, and then next to that it says the critical value z alpha over 2 is equal to 1.960. So we're going to steal that from that table. We have times the square root of, and then we have p hat, which is equal to what we got in part a, which is 0 0.0912. 1 minus p hat, and then we divide this all by n, which is 362. So substituting this all in on your calculator, you get a value of 0 0.0297, and this is e, our margin of error. Part c says to construct a 95% confidence interval. We have a couple different methods to do this. First one is we can use the calculator and go ahead and do one prop z int that like was discussed in the box previously. Or since we know p hat and we know e, we can use the fact that p hat minus e is our lower bound and p hat plus e is our upper bound. And since we know that p hat is 0 0.0912 and e is 0 0.0297, we are able to calculate both the upper and the lower bounds. So adding and subtracting that margin of error. And when we do this, we get a value of 0 0.0615 is less than P. 
is less than 0 0.1209. So that would be our 95% confidence interval. And then part D says write a statement that correctly interprets the confidence interval. So about 95% of these confidence intervals will contain the true proportion So the true proportion of not accurate drive through orders and about 5% will not. So on my open math, they will have this typed out for you, however there will be some fill in the blanks for the part of the homework and quizzes. So these that I just boxed and highlighted are going to be blanks. And so about 95% of these confidence intervals will tr contain the true proportion. That 95% is from that confidence interval that we were told. And then that 5% is that 100% minus that confidence interval or that value of alpha, if you think of it that way, that will not. So right below this, it says, as sample size increases, the results of a narrow confidence interval and the margin of error decreases. So below this, there's another box. It says sample size needed for estimated population proportion P. So when estimate a P hat is known, we're able to calculate the number of samples that we need to, to collect from by doing z alpha over 2 squared times p hat times q hat divided by e squared and rounding up to the next integer. And then when no estimate is known, so we don't have any data from a previous study or anything like that, we have z alpha over 2 squared times 0.25 divided by e squared and then also rounding up to the next integer. So one usefulness of this is going to be trying to figure out the proportion of people that react positively to the COVID-19 vaccination and they needed to know how large of a sample they had to collect from to show that it was effective. And so this would be the way that they would go about to calculate that sample size needed from how many people they needed to collect data from. So the example right below this says, find the sample size needed to estimate the percentage of California residents who are left-handed. Use a margin of error and three percentage points and a confidence level of 99%. Part A says, assume that nothing is known about the percentage of left-hand residents in California. So in order to figure out our sample size, which is what we need to for this problem, since we don't know anything about our um, percentage of left-handed residents in California, that means that we will need to use that second equation on here. It says when no estimate of PHAT is known. So there was no study previously done is what we're saying. And that formula is going to be Z alpha over 2 squared times 0 0.25 divided by E squared. And so now looking at everything that we have, Z alpha over 2. Again, this you need to look at page 2 of your notes at that table. And since we're dealing with a 99% confidence level, if you look at page 2, 99% confidence level, we know alpha is equal to 0 0.01. And then next to that's the critical value, which is equal to 2.576. And again, that's squared times 0 0.25 and then times e squared and so if you look at this we it does tell us that margin of error of three percentage points so this is three percentage points or three percent and we need to express this as a decimal so 0 0.03 
and then squaring this. Substituting this all in on your calculator, you get 1,843.27. The formula does state that you need to round up to the next integer. And the reason why is because this is saying we need 1,843 people, but there's also that 0.27, so a little bit more of another person. Well, I can't just survey a little bit of another person. I need to round that up to the next whole number. So we're gonna always round these up. It will never tell you to do this. This is just something that you need to know from the formula. And so this will round up to 1,844 people or California residents. Part B says assume that based on a prior study, about 10% of Californians are left-handed. So this one, they had a prior study and they know that 10% of Californians are left-handed. So from our formulas up above, it says that when the estimate of p hat is known, so we do know something, we know p hat is equal to 0.10 or 10%. So we're gonna be using that first formula that's up there, so z alpha over two, squared times p hat times q hat, all divided by e squared. So substituting in z alpha over 2, that is 2.576, we're going to square this times p hat, which is 0 0.10, and then times q hat, which is 1 minus p hat, all divided by e squared, and e is still 0 0.03 squared. And also our z alpha over two is also still the same value since we're still dealing with a 99% confidence level. So substituting this into the calculator, first thing I want you to know is that we have some prior data. And so thinking about the value of how big your sample should be, it should be smaller since we already know something about this study. And so when you plug this in on your calculator, you get 663.58. And again, we always round up. So rounding up, we get 664 people.